I would like to share with you the situation in Colombia. And uh, I have many questions that I hope uh, we have the, the opportunity to answer during the debate because we are in a great situation in Colombia where we can do a lot of the studies that you didn't have the chance to do because of um, the sudden um, realization of the, uh, of the outbreak that you are now studying. Next, please. This is the main event in Colombia right now. We have been pleased, uh, promised in the, um, this month, and um, I invite you to all uh, support and country in this pursuit of reconciliation. I want to put this map here just to show some of the differences that may um, impact the differences also that we may observe in the epidemiology of Zika between Brazil and Colombia. As you see there, we are Andean country, so we have 80% of our territory, it's um, under 2,200 2, um, meters above sea level, but most of the population lives in the Andean regions, so where there is no transmission of, um, of dengue or we don't expect transmission of Zika, but we also have uh, transmission of Zika in travelers. Next, please. This is the second big problem that we face, and is the health system in crisis. So we also have a very different um, health system in Colombia that also may affect the way that we survey and identify the Zika in Colombia and the spread of Zika. We also have 10 times less population than Brazil and, and births as well. And half of those, burns, uh, of those births happen in the private sector. So that affects also because as you imagine, the health insurers are not necessarily willing to pay for exams that are important for research, but non they don't necessarily see how they are important uh, for clinical care. And so then we will need to define, um, prioritize how are, you, are we going to use our limited resources and also how are we going to negotiate with the private insurance the uh, probability of doing research. There is also public health very different from Brazil because we have decentralization, which means all the funds for public health, except for vaccines, go directly to the local prefectures, to the local uh, mayors, and they are the ones who decide how to allocate these resources. So actually, the central government has little to say in the way the budget, local budgets are spent for public health measures. Next, please. As you see here in the lower part, maybe you cannot see, but the lower part of the slide just shows uh, May 7, 2015, when WHO and um, Op um, PAHO raised the alert about Zika in the continent, in Brazil. And the following week, there was a uh, meeting at the Ministry of Health to get ready, to prepare for the arrival of Zika in Colombia, thing that you didn't have the chance to do. And after that, it was press bulletin. And in September, uh, five months after the, uh, that meeting, there was the report of outbreak in the, one of the small towns, poorest towns in the Caribbean coast of Colombia that has a very active um, activity of circulation of people with Venezuela. In October 16, the first Zika case was confirmed among these people who was in this outbreak. And I just want to point out at the time of the outbreak, uh, we have local elections, and that means that we have change in the governments for, the, for this year. So in January, there were new local governments that impact the um, probability to the continuous vector control. It's actually interrupted between changing in the local governments, and I think that's going to affect a lot the, the curve of the epidemic in Colombia. Then we have more information coming from you about the neurological involvement, both in microcephaly and also in Guillain-Barre and other clinical manifestations. And with that, also we have a budget cut in Colombia equivalent to $2,000 million. And actually, our National Institute of Health have a cut as well for uh, their current jobs. At the times of the epidemic, so it's not very healthy to have that for the National Institute of Health. So that's, that's the real situation that actually impact our capacity to do our own research with our own funds. Then we have um, meetings with the research societies and then 26 research priorities for the country were listed. 
and set up and communicate it to all these uh, co-parents from outside who wanted to be part of this research in Colombia. And intensified surveillance was done in risk groups, including pregnant women, children, and elderly. And there was um, a new introduction of the, these measures to the local governments, urging them to in, implement the new vec the vector control activities. And CDC arrived in Colombia, and they have been uh, very important partners in this research. Next. Next, please. So this is uh, the strategy of preparation for the epidemic and response. So it has three components that you see are three phases, including risk assessment, communication, improve the capacity of the National Institute of Health that meant implementing the laboratory techniques for detection of Zika and diagnosis of Zika, and the recommendation to strengthen vector control that this is the plan of the National Institute of Health of Colombia. In the second phase, so there is a lot of uh, risk communication to the public the research priorities and the guidelines very much review from what the ones that you have produced here in Brazil. And we are in the phase now of monitoring and adjustments. So one of the things I would like to learn from, from you here is actually how to monitor both private and public sector in their response and compliance with the follow-up of the pregnant women, for example. Next. Another thing the government did was to prioritize the towns for vector control and research and this is, was based basically in the uh, information that we have of dengue, chikungunya, and Zika. And uh, the uses of, or the situation that we currently have because of El Nino with a shortage of water supply. And this was, they produce an index where they, uh, it allows them to prioritize the municipalities, but not necessarily as they are the ones that we are observing the Zika epidemic. Next but the neo prioritization is there. Vector control should be the first activities that need to be done. I mean, we can uh, carry on counting patients and then following the pregnant woman, but we don't want them to get infected in the first place. So there are lots of challenges for vector control. I here just summarize some of them. I know putting here all the social determinants that need to be addressed, and yes, the Secretary of Health of uh, has Steve been mentioned this morning. I think that's the most important one. But in the meantime, I think that one of the main challenges is that the current recommendations for vector control and behavioral ch uh, change in communities have very small scale impact. So you can actually use a lot of resources, but only impact in small neighborhoods. So we need large scale interventions. Entomological surveillance, as it currently done, does not measure productivity of the breeding size. And I just put up these posters of a project that we did in one of the towns in Colombia, where we uh, aim to educate people about storage, water storage and water management. And we went there and actually found that mosquitoes were coming from outside their houses. The main, the most productive breeding site were actually the water um, drainage or storm drains, storm trumps. I don't see them here in Pernambuco. I think you have a different design, but this, uh, storms in the area where we live, for example, here in this small town of 100,000 inhabitants, there are 5,500 of these devices and are the main breeding sites. So you really need an army of field workers to go every two weeks, every four nights, putting larvicides in these drain storms. So the sustainability of the field worker is expensive for a little town with a fiscal cut and um, also all the political things happening that doesn't allow them to have a continuous intervention of the vector control. So we have um, shortage of the contracts of the field workers. They are not all year round, but maybe 10, if they are lucky, 10 months of the year, they will work and, and be able to do their vector control activities. Not to mention the shortage in the water supplies for people to actually store water. Next. So this, this is the epidemic curve that we have in, in red, is in total Colombia. So as you see, we have in October the first case, and then from that is that a very steep increase in the number of cases in the country. You see a bit of decrease at the end of the year, so that's the decrease of reporting due to the uh, Christmas um, festivities. And then you see how the different regions, we have Zika now in all the regions of the country, 
So how they have been coming uh, late in the epidemic. So first, we're in the Caribbean coast, as I mentioned, when it started, didn't start in the border with Brazil. We have a very low density of population there. So we think it came with the Caribbean, probably with the contact with the Venezuela uh, population or interchange that we have there. And there, the nor'easter as well in the border with Venezuela. But later on, then we have the Andean region and also the intervalley uh, uh, populations and uh, the south of the country. Next, please. This is just to show that it's all over uh, Colombia. And uh, to this um, six week, week of this month, we have almost uh, oh, a bit more than 37 cases reported. But there is a lot of uh, misclassification here as well. Our report of dengue has increased, and we have dengue mortality as well. So we have current outbreaks of Zika and dengue as well. Uh, we have uh, more than, uh, than 6,000 women reported uh, with Zika suspected, of which uh, are, they are almost 20% 20, 20 of the entire number of Zika reported cases, and more than 500 that have been lab confirmed by RT-PCR. Next. In the state that I, I'm located, so we have this um, car by, uh, by sex and age group, it, it, five GSH groups. And uh, what you can see here in this, in this graph is that um, women are, it seems to be a higher risk of Zika but, uh, than men. And, but when you see the percentage in the pink line of those cases that are actually pregnant women, so you can see one of them, for example, is up to 30% of all the cases in women are pregnant women. So we think this is mainly due to the fact that there is a lot of awareness among pregnant women of the risk they are in. We don't have yet the entire credibility of the medical community of the link. I think it will take time for them to see first the cases, the poor cases of macrocephalia and neurozika. But uh, among women and pregnant women, there is a lot of awareness and they are uh, seeking care uh, in relation to Zika. Next. So we uh, are doing our uh, bit of a job as researchers and designer studies and already collecting a lot of samples and, and data that we hope are going to shed light in this uh, temporal criteria for um, causality in these associations that you have already described here. So these are 26, as I mentioned, uh, research priorities for the country, but I just want to put up these two that I think are uh, two that we need to do quickly before actually the epidemic decreases there. So we are in a unique time in Colombia to be able to answer lots of questions that you have here raised. Uh, they are the follow-up and the cohort of the pregnant women. And, and there is a big challenge there, as I mentioned, because of some of the exams are not covered by the healthcare providers. So we need the funds to pay for those exams and to do proper research and quality research with this cohort and to answer those questions and answer to those families. I am personally involved in the neurological manifestation, so we are doing case series and case control studies with incident cases, so we can actually have proper controls in the studies. And we want to address uh, not only clinical and epidemiological issues, but also more wider questions about arboviruses and dengue, dengue interaction and physiopathogenesis of, of these diseases. We are going to publish soon it's already submitted a case series of uh, neurological manifestations uh, with a network of neurologists, clinicians that have already reported the increased number, not only of Guillain-Barre, but myelitis and other man neurological manifestations. So we hope that the funding is going to arrive on time, not late, to do uh, better uh, quality clinical uh, research and, and basic research. And we have partnered with uh, uh, some um, researchers in the US. Uh, CDC has supported a lot of this, and, but they are also looking for funds to try to carry on these, these studies. And uh, next, please. So I thought I have kept my 15 minutes, and thank you again for the learning experience. <laughs>